word out. Kingdom citizens, here are our announcements for today. Join us on Sunday, May 28th, 2023 at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time at Delta Hotel Woodbridge, located at 515 U.S. Highway 1 South, Island, New Jersey, as we celebrate Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday. For more information, go to wordofink.org. Come and SOS a sponsor of streaming, and help us to continue to share the teachings of the kingdom. For more information, go to wordofink.org and click on SOS. We thank you in advance. Watch our services online on our website, IBM Video, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. For more information, you can go to our website at wordofbank.org. You can email us at wordofbank at yahoo.com or you can call us at 1 877 Word of One. Without further ado, please welcome Pastor Patty James. All right. Welcome, Kingdom Citizens. We greet you. Welcome to the Kingdom. First time viewers, we welcome you to the Kingdom. Thank you for joining us. We're so glad to have you. And we say blessings to each and every one of you. Hope you're listening to those announcements. Our Pentecost service is coming up very soon. We're still in the Feast of Weeks. We're counting down to Pentecost. Praise God, the wonderful, wonderful return of Holy Spirit. And uh, we are just excited. We look forward to seeing you. I hope you're making plans to come out. Make plans. Do what you have to do. It will be worth it. We have some wonderful things we're going to share with you, and we'll be giving out things according to the message. Praise God. We try and uh, stay in the context of the scriptures. And so we have a very special word that we'll be sharing with you Uh and uh, we just want you to really be blessed of God. Amen. All right. We have birthday shout out. Let's do that right now. And then we'll get right into our word concerning you. All right. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, Pastor Val's son, Shane Moses, you have a wonderful day coming up. Your blessed day, your birthday. And I want to say, man of God, very wise and smart man of God. 120 be unto you, likened unto Moses. I hope you have a blessed and prosperous day. In Jesus' name, you are a blessed man of God. Praise God. All right. So we're continuing in the word of God. We want to give you words for your passion. We're dealing with the passion of God's people because God puts that there and it's for his purpose and it's for his will and it blesses you, it stirs you, it encourages you, it keeps you going, praise God. It's one of the reasons why you're even on this live stream, because God has placed within you this wonderful passion to seek him out and to do what he has called you to do. So we want to uh, really be able to encourage you and help you in that which God has put in your spirit. <clears throat> and I believe these uh, words are going to fill you. We want to give you words for your passion today. Words for your passion. In other words, I'm going to say the word, and then I'm going to give you a scripture for that word, as well as an encouraging thought that hopefully will, you know, help you to maintain the thought of that word. Because passion, again, I believe it comes from God. Now, many have misused and abused it. You have leaders who 
totally misused and abused it. It was a passion, but it was in the wrong direction for the wrong things, okay? So you don't want to even think like that. We're not even going that direction because your passion is for the glory of God. God gets glory out of what he placed in you. And when you begin to manifest that, the more you manifest what God has placed in you, you see, the more you're being who you are. And the more you're being who you are, the more God can bless and anoint you and use you. And isn't that what we're here for? We want to fulfill our purpose. You should always pray the prayer, Lord, preserve me for your purpose. All right. Any attack that comes on your life, any kind of sickness, any kind of uh, financial crisis, anything, Lord, preserve me for your purpose. And he will do just that. The other thing I've been sharing with you is every day on a daily basis, I say, Holy Spirit, I always acknowledge you. I never ignore you. And I think that that's something, if you keep it in your thoughts, you say, but I, I don't always acknowledge. But if you start saying it, you will. You'll remember to always acknowledge him. He is the means of you getting to where you got to go. Without him, we can't do anything. We can't get to where we're going. So I encourage you to just take these little sayings and it, it, you'll see how helpful they are, how much it really gets you uh, to that goal of what God has placed in your spirit. So let's pray and go right into words for your passion in Jesus name. Spirit of living God, we know we can do nothing without you. Holy Spirit, I always acknowledge you. I never ignore you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your leading and your guidance. Thank you for these, those who are the chosen. They're the called according to your purpose. Preserve them, Lord, for your purpose, that your will be fulfilled in their lives and many will be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, first word up. The first word up is adversary. It's important that we know that Jesus spent more time talking about your adversary, the devil, than even salvation. You say, really? But he came so we was, yes, he came so that we might be saved and he dealt with that, but he dealt more. There are more scriptures dealing with Jesus, talking about the adversary, than really anything else. Well, what about born again? Truth is, Jesus never preached born again. That was a private conversation between him and Nicodemus. Check it out now. He was a religious ruler and he wanted to understand the kingdom. And being that he was living in a kingdom at the time under the Roman Empire, Jesus felt like you should know this. You know, you're asking me things that you know to become royalty, you have to be born into royalty. You know this already, Nicodemus. And so that was a private conversation. Jesus never preached a born again message. His preaching was about kingdom. And you'd search the Bible, search the scripture. You will not see him talking about it again. He had this conversation with a religious ruler, which tells me that religion has really prevented the message of the kingdom. But anyway, he spent more time making you aware of the adversary. And this is why we spend uh, quite a bit of time teaching you spiritual warfare. You need spiritual warfare. OK, some will think that all oh, is not necessary. I don't know. It's absolutely necessary. All right. So adversary and the scripture is Isaiah 43 and two. And I'll, I think I'll call the scripture out first and then I'll give case time to put it up on the screen for you. And then I'll read you a thought that will hopefully help you. Isaiah 43 and two says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle up on you. So any situation that you can come upon, whether it feel like you're drowning or whether you're on fire, he's saying, I'm going to be with you. It reminds me when you talk about fire, he's the fourth one in the furnace, okay? When he's talking about, uh, you know, rivers and, and running over and floods and things of that sort, well, he's already provided for you because actually you have the rivers of living water. And so you need to understand that he's with you and you, but you, he wants you to know you do have an adversary. These things will come against you, but you need to understand that he's with you, that you're not alone, all right? And that, 
the, here's a little thought for you. The size of your enemy determines the size of your reward. In other words, God wants you to conquer this. It's like he knows you have what it takes to win. Conquer it so that he can bless you and then move you to the next level. All right. So everyone needs to know, yes, you have an adversary, but he is far more afraid of you than you should ever be afraid of him. All right. And know then that your authority is to be used against your adversary, not people. You're not fighting with people. We're not wrestle not with flesh and blood. OK, but we're dealing with the principalities, the adversaries that absolutely want to prevent and stop you. If the enemy could just vacuum the life of your passion out of you, he's he's won because then you'll have no zeal. You'll have no determination to move forward in what God has given you. All right. I move to Proverbs 17 and 22. Your next word up is attitude. We talked a little bit about attitude because I think people are not as aware of their attitude as they should be. I remember we was, you know, with some folks, just some friends or whatever, hanging around. And this one person, uh, you know, they looked like they were down and out. I thought, well, maybe I need just maybe have a little talk with them, see how they're doing. Oh, and she just, she, he goes on, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything. I said, well, then notify your face because you are looking like you are really done here. And, you know, uh, attitude has everything to do with your outward appearance and how you appear to people pretty much will cause them to have, that'll be how they deal with you. All right. Proverbs 17 and 22 says a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. And we know good and well that it affects your health everything about your attitude is amazing because when your attitude is right, guess what? It begins to help your body and your healthy uh, functions to, to really be okay. But people just, I don't think people are as aware of their attitudes, you know, as they should be because it becomes so common just to be a certain way. And I'm saying you, you really need to be aware of that. And that's why Proverbs 17 kind of tells you, a merry heart is good medicine. You want to start healing and get better. I, I, when I don't feel so good, I make sure I find something or put on a, a DVD or something that's going to make me laugh because I know laughter really will. It, I'm telling you, it's the same. Uh, what do they call them? I forget the word. But the same release that you get from taking you know, drugs and things of that sort, people don't realize that laughter does that. It it releases certain levels of adrenaline that really can heal and make you feel better. All right. So again, the attitude, here's your saying, the attitude of the servant determines the atmosphere of the palace. All right. And that reminds me of Nehemiah when he was so upset and the king said, what's wrong with you? And he was saying how he wanted to rebuild the walls and so on and so forth. And because he presented himself in such a manner that the king says, OK, I'll give you whatever you need and you can go and build it. And because the king was so used to him having such a merry heart, he didn't want to see him so sad and so down and out. Listen, you have a nice word for somebody. Why don't you give it to them and help them, help them with their attitude, help them to feel better. All right. Here's our next word. Uh, Amos, Amos chapter three and three, Amos three and three. Like I said, I'll give the scriptures first so you can write them down. Make sure you get them. Uh, again, this is building up your passion. These are words to help your passion. All right. Now, relationships, of course, of course, relationships reflect, uh, affect just about every part of your being. All right. Amos three and three says, how can two it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? And this covers so many areas of our life, you know, whether it be in business, you know, watch who you're going under contracts with. Watch who you're going to business with. These are very important areas because if you don't have the kind of relationship or working relationship, as they say, that can turn into a disaster and then you're bound by a contract, you're bound into it. All right. So Amos, basically, he says, unless you agree, you, you're not going to be able to walk together. All right. And here's your saying for that. Those that are unwilling to discern your integrity are unqualified for your relationship. I'll say that again. Those that are unwilling to discern your integrity 
are unqualified for your relationship. I remember having to uh, end various ministry friendships because certain people were willing to do things that were just not scriptural. And it was against my integrity. I didn't feel comfortable with it. And I, I knew at that point that these you know, ties are gonna have to be cut because I'm not going to uh, you know, jeopardize my character and my integrity for people doing things that were not biblical, all right? So again, Amos three and three, Okay, and okay, I'll say that again. The, the saying it says, "Those unwilling to discern your integrity are unqualified for your relationship." I think that's crucial because anybody who's going to affect your integrity, your character, they're not. They don't qualify for. You know what? The idea is what they're going to pull you into what they're doing, and if what they're doing is just not right. If it's not biblical, you know, and I could go do a list of, of folk who I just had to, you know, I just had to sever ties because I knew that that was not biblical. Those things were not, you know, appropriate. And your integrity is very important in terms of uh, how can I say securing your passion. You know, and your integrity can secure that passion, and it, it will never be insulted by someone who, who wants to be around you, but they want to do less than what it takes. All right. <clears throat> All right. Let's go to the next one. Crisis. Crisis always comes up from time to time. Crisis uh, is a big one. Let's look at Psalms 27 and 1. Psalms. I'll give you two scriptures. Psalms 27 and verse 1 and Psalms 46. All right. Psalms 46 verses 1 through 3. I'll see. Can I find the other one so I can read it to you? And again, you need you need the word for your passion. Don't think that just because you know you want to do something, you like it, you, it, it it's going to happen. You need word. Word is what's going to get you through whatever it is that your your passion is is moving you toward. And you need the word of God. All right. So <clears throat> I said Psalms twenty seven and one, which I'll read that, and then also Psalms forty six. See if I can find that for you. Verses one, <clears throat> and I'll read that too. All right, so for, Psalm 27 and one says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? So already it's putting a calm when crisis come, whether it be financial, whether it be business, I can uh, look from time to time, you know, in ministry, some crisis came up and boy, oh boy, it was like, you know, it just kind of knocks the air out of you. So where did this come from? And these were major attacks. And you talk about crisis, the enemy wants you to buckle under. <clears throat> when, and this is why it brings these things. So you got to know the Lord is, that's why own nothing. Don't take ownership of it as the Lord. This is your ministry. When you make sure that you know who's the right owner, you're going you're gonna to be triumphant. But as long as you think it's yours and you're trying to do things of yourself, that's where the problems begin. All right. Also, Psalms 46, verses 1 and 3. Let me see. Psalms 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. All right, so he's making it clear that all these things can happen, okay? But the Lord is my strength. He's my refuge. I go to him only if people would just know to remember. That's why I say, Holy Spirit, I always acknowledge you. I never ignore you. It makes me always remember no matter what comes, the first thing I do is I go to him. Okay, here's your saying for crisis. Crisis always occurs at the curve of change. I'll say that again. And I'm sharing again from my mentor, Mike Murdoch. He's just a very wise man, a wisdom center and workshops and seminars and things he conducts to this day. And I use these materials from years ago, from years back. All right, crisis always occurs at the curve of change. And this is a true thing. When change is coming, 
in the midst of things are happening. I, I often share that in between dispensations on the cross and moving into the dispensation of grace, a lot of really unusual things took place. And it's not for you to panic. It's for you to go to your Lord. Go to the Lord. Don't ever get to the point where you don't think you need to go to the Lord. I go to him for everything. And that's how you make it through. That's how you come out. you clothed in your right mind. All right. Let's look at the next word up. Decision making. Decision making. That's a big one. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 is good. Proverbs 3 verses 5. And six, when you're talking about decision making, decision making, this is uh, a, a most difficult for everybody. Oh, I hate when I have to get to those places where now you got to make a decision. I remember some time ago when we, you know, I purchased this building and what a, a nightmare. It just became such a nightmare. And to give it up and, you know, sell it or try and keep it, that was just the hardest decision. And Holy Spirit said to me, you know, why are you trying to make this decision? God has already made this decision for you. And it was so true because we didn't have to put the house, the, the building on a market. We didn't have to do anything. That person had heard about me. I don't know how he heard about me. Anyway, he approached me, wanted to purchase the building. We, we lost nothing in it. And it, it was just God. When you look to God for everything, I assure you, I assure you, everything he said, every word he said is true. All right, let me read Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That means this is you got to be all in. Don't be double-minded and back and forth. That double-minded stuff is no good. All right? And that doubt and unbelief comes under that same category of double-minded. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, do what? Acknowledge him, okay? And he shall direct your paths. That's why I say, Holy Spirit, I always acknowledge you. I never ignore you. And this is of a truth. If you will always acknowledge him and never, you're going to come out on top. You're going to come. It'll, it'll be difficult. It looks challenging. Uh, that's what crises do. They look crazy. It looks challenging. But I know for a fact, I know from experience, when I can just put a calm on myself, take a deep breath, just calm all that down and start talking to Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, it works. You'll come out on top every time. Here's your saying. Those without your goals may never understand your decisions. Okay, I'll say it again. Those without your goals may never understand your decision. Some decision-making, you have to make it. And can you, can I tell you, everybody's not always going to be pleased with your decision, okay? Uh, people are going to have attitudes and all sorts of bickering. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, you made the decision. It's a wrap now. You, you can get mad at me. You can do whatever. But the decision is made. Those without your goals may never understand your decisions. Don't try and make someone understand why you had to decide to do what you had to do because they don't have the kind of goals. They don't have the drive nor the passion. And your passion is what's moving you in the direction that you. And I just believe that even like Abraham, if you make a wrong decision, God is so with you in terms of your passion and what he has placed in you that you still don't lose. You know, Abraham made a couple of bad decisions, but he still came out on top. I just believe that when you're where you're supposed to be in Christ, you're just not going to fail. You're just going to come out on, even when you make wrong decisions. I have made some wrong decisions, okay? And I know for a fact, God, he was able to bear me up in the midst of it, despite of, oh, people of God, it, there's just no life without him. There's no way to live without him. All right, can I say it again? Those without your goals may never understand your decisions. Let's go to the next word up. Next word up discretion. <laughs> Bless God. Woo, discretion. That's a good one. All right. Psalms 112. Okay. Psalms 112. And let's look at verse five for discretion. Discretion is very, very important, especially when you have goals and you have 
ideas and you know you can want something so bad you got to be careful how you go about getting it you know what i'm saying it's like when the scripture talks about temptation you know it and and talk about craving and desires it's not wrong with any of those things it's just how you go about fulfilling them that's that's the problem how you go about fulfilling it discretion i said Psalms 112 okay a good man shows favor and lends he will guide his affairs with discretion. Now, this is a good one because I said many times when you, you lend and help others, never give them the fullness of what you have. Never, 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 never. The fact that they're asking you for something is already showing you they are not at the level you are. So never try to give them all of what you think you know, even all of what they're asking for it, you shouldn't do it because it shows they need to make some kind of investment towards what it is they're asking you for. And when you understand this, you realize if you're a 10 gallon and they're a five gallon, do not pour all of that into because it's going to waste. They're going to waste it. They don't know how to handle it. It's like you have to know who you are. And this is not being arrogant or superior or anything like that. This is discretion. Everybody can't handle all that you have to give to them. And sometimes family out of love and, you know, pity and all those things that we feel, we lose discretion. And I'm sure you can count many times how you said they, they didn't even, I shouldn't have gave them that. I shouldn't have gave them that much or I shouldn't have. That. Think about that because discretion really happens far more with your interchanging and interacting with family members than any other time. We have discretion moments, yes, where we have an indiscretion, but it's mostly with family because family feels like, because you're family, you're supposed to. Most of them don't even realize it's a favor. It, they, they think it's you, they're entitled. They have this mentality of entitlement because you're family, you're supposed to do. And I'm saying don't fall for that. Use your discretion. Know just for the fact that they're asking you that they are having a, a, a far lesser moment than you are. And you can't pour all that you are into someone. Let me give you, a, here's your saying, never discuss a problem with someone incapable of solving it. <laughs> it just makes sense to me. Don't tell everybody. You know, it's, it's, it's so funny that people on social media, are they're posting things that really should be left to privacy, they're posting things, looking for public opinions and public approval. Uh, where is your discretion in doing that? If public, they're not gonna help you if they can't really solve what you're saying. Why post it for a bunch of strangers to judge and criticize? I, I, I certainly, I'm still having a problem understanding social media and the things that God's people are doing with that format. Never discuss a problem with someone incapable of solving it. All right, let's go to your next word up. Your next word up is economy. Economy. <clears throat> and remember, all these words have to do with your passion. All right, Psalms. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, discretion. And never discuss a problem with someone incapable of solving it, okay? Now, Casey's writing these, I think, because he's gonna put them up so for people who miss them, they can go online. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I thought so. Because usually afterwards, people say, well, can we go to line online and find these? He's putting them up, he's posting them while I'm doing this so that you'll have it. So just in case you miss something, you'll be able to uh, go back and get it. All right, economy. And again, Psalms 112 and 7. Psalm. Many of the Psalms, the themes go along with, you know, it, they have themes and, and you can read them and see how that theme, which one is actually manifesting. All right. So that's 112 and 7. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed and trusting in the Lord. I'll say it again. You shall not be afraid of evil tidings. 
okay, when the economy breaks and everything is going up and nothing is good, finances, all these things they're talking about, don't be afraid of their tidings. I told you many times you need to turn the news off. I remember the whole original, the original intent of news was supposed to be good things. They were supposed to be acting like the Bible, which was gospel, which gospel means interpreted good news, but that's all changed. It's not like that anymore. You want to get depressed real quick? Turn on the news. <laughs> okay. All right. So he's saying you will not be afraid of evil tidings. When they start pronouncing all these bad things, they're trying to pronounce yet another disease, another uh, virus, another something. I've been hearing it. And it's like they keep trying to come up with stuff to stir up people. And he says, your heart is fixed. Why? Because no matter what they say, you're trusting in the Lord. You're not trusting in the man. You're not trusting in this economy. You are not on this world system economy. You are on the economy system of the Lord. Again, the acronym for tithe is tithe is the highest economic system. Tithe is the highest economic system. There is no system better than that. When you are in God's system, you are going to be all right. You're going to be fine no matter what they say. No matter, I have lived through it. I know it for a fact that if you will just go with God and don't get caught up in the world system, no matter what they announce, you're going to be all right. He shall, you shall not be afraid of evil news announcements. You shall not be afraid of the eyewitness news or the evening news or CBS news or CNN news. You'll not be afraid of that. Why? Because you are trusting in the Lord. Here's your saying. Every step towards self-sufficiency is a step away from God's sufficiency. Every step towards your self so that you are not to step away from God. Don't try and think you can take care of yourself. You can do it all. No, every step towards self sufficiency, you doing it on your own, you being on your own, you coming up with your own. No, that's a step away from God's sufficiency because he sustains you. My God shall supply all my needs. According to his riches, not what I have, not what I can get, not what I can come up with, but according to his riches in glory is how he will supply my needs. All right. That's your saying. Every step towards self-sufficiency is a step away from God. I hope you understand that because sometimes you're too dependent on what you can do. You're too dependent on what you can come up with. Every step towards self-sufficiency is a step away from God's sufficiency. He is able. I'm, I'm remembering another scripture talking about we're not sufficient of ourselves because it's his sufficiency that we rely on. Okay. When you have insufficient funds, God's sufficiency makes up for it and will cover it in Jesus name. All right. You good, Case? All right. Let's go to the next one. Your next word up is favor. <laughs> Praise God. Favor. Your next word up is favor. Let's look at Psalms 5 and 12. Psalms chapter 5 and verse 12. And I got, I think I have two sayings for you. All right. For you, Lord will bless the righteous. Remember, you are the righteousness of God. For you, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor will you compass him as with a shield. I like this scripture. This one is wonderful because he's saying you compass will be, you'll be covered all the way around with the shield and the, the Lord's favor cannot be penetrate. You, you, evil cannot penetrate the Lord's favor. I think sometimes when you don't understand why people don't like you, or, that is just the devil. He's so mad because he just couldn't get through. He couldn't break or penetrate that favor, that shield that compasses all about you, that God has all around about you. It's like, you know, yeah, I, I say this, God loves you, but I'm his favorite. Praise God. You, you get that in his favor. He loves you. I know he loves you, but I'm his favorite. 
And you should have that in your mind because that's why some folk uh, uh, don't even like you and they don't even know why. They don't know why. They don't know why. And the funny thing is, is there's nothing you can do about the favor of God. You can't, no one can do anything. You can't even do anything about it. You know, it's a wonderful thing when you see little nice things happening for you. You can identify that as, wow, that's the, that's just the favor of God. That's God's favor upon me. It, it, it's, just, it's just there. And the devil don't like it. And he'll try and use people to penetrate it and get through it. Yeah, I like it too, woman of God. Yes, I do. I like it too. He'll try and do, and he can't do anything about the favor of God is a wonderful thing. He says, you, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will compass him as with a shield. He just covers you. Glory to God. So you all just make it a habit. Say, you know what? God loves you, but I'm his favorite. Praise God. Go ahead and get on the devil's nerve some more. Here's your saying. Here's your saying. For one day of favor is worth a lifetime of labor. You got that? One day of favor is worth a lifetime of labor. That's cool, isn't it? Because the favor is so powerful. It's so wonderful. It's so surrounding. You're just surrounded by it. And this is a wonderful thing, praise God, to know that you have the favor of God. If you're the righteousness of God, you have the favor of God. Amen. All right. Here's another saying for you. The proof of your love is the passion to pleasure. When you love genuinely, you always have a passion to make people happy, to have people enjoy their lives, enjoy themselves. The proof of your love is the passion to pleasure. You love to see people enjoy themselves. We have some things coming up. I'm excited. Uh, eventually we'll announce them and it's just going to be so much fun. It's going to be such a wonderful time and everyone's going to be able to benefit from it. Uh, and you just stay tuned for that. It's coming up. It's coming up. All right. Ready for your next word up? Your next word up is fear of God. You know, I like the Ecclesiastic Solomon summed it up. He says, you know, let's have a conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Okay. Just fear him and keep his word. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. Glory to God. Fear of God. Let's give you scripture. Psalms 11, 111. Have Psalms 1, 1, 1, 10. Uh, you certainly can take that one. <laughs> yes, you can, woman of God, ambassador. Help yourself. <laughs> Glory to God. All right. Psalms uh, 111 and verses 10. And he also gives me another one. So let me see if I can find that one while we get Psalms. Psalms 111. And verse 10, and then we'll also do Proverbs 9 and verse 10. All right, fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? That's a wonderful, familiar passage, right? A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endures forever. That's just sweet. That's just a sweet psalm. All right, I'll read Proverbs 9 and 10. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me, thy days shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased. Wow, that's nice. It says, if you be wise, you shall be wise for yourself, but if you scorn, you alone shall bear it. So wisdom is so much better than anything else. All right, let me give you your saying for fear of God. Your respect towards people reveals your fear of God. That's a good one. Your respect towards people reveals your fear of God, because how can you say you reverence the Lord, but you have no respect for his people, right? So your 
your respect or reverence towards people reveals your reverence and your respect of God because these are God's people, his creation. And God says, listen, in John, he picks it up and says, how can you say you love God and you don't love your brother? He said, that means you're lying, <laughs> okay? So it's very important to realize how God feels about his people. Glory to God. All right, are we ready to move on? We good? Your next word up. Your next word up is goal setting. Everyone needs to have goal setting. You set your goals, don't set them so high that you cannot accomplish them because then you lose faith. All right, Habakkuk 2, chapter two of Habakkuk and uh, read verses two and three. So that's Habakkuk 2 and verses two and three. We'll say it again for Casey. Habakkuk chapter two, verses two and three. All right. And this is for goal setting. And it's so important to set goals for yourself in anything, because once you see that goal accomplished, it gives you the encouragement and the courage to go on to the next thing. All right. He says, write the vision, make it plain upon tables, meaning tablets, that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So this is wonderful that you can set goals and I think this is a very important scripture for those who have visions and dreams things that they're believing for and working on. I say, when you write it out, you know, put it someplace so you can pick it back up and read it from time to time. This is really what fuels your passion so that you don't give up because sometimes things just take a lot longer than what we expected it to. I don't know about you, but I think there are some things in my life as well as yours that you're wondering, good grief, how much longer, all right? And so write it out write it plain, and then con re remind yourself of it. Con continue to read it, okay? Here's your saying for goal settings. The clearer your goal, the greater your faith, okay? The clearer your goal, the greater your faith. That's very simple because if your goals are clear and distinct, like I said, don't just write out a whole lot of things. Some of you remember when we used to pray for names and we would ask just the first name only because that's how the Holy Spirit would work in me. And we saw so many people's lives changed, salvations, deliverance, took just by calling out their names. And some just couldn't do it. They had to get the full name and then they're writing out their, their that's my nephew's uh, cousin, sister's brother. And it's like all God needs is to, as if God doesn't know who they are, you know? And when we understand that, write it out, make it plain. Don't add all this stuff as if God don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Just, he's the one that put it there. Okay, this is to encourage you. This is not to inform God. It's to encourage you. So you write it out plain, make it simple and to the point, and then remind yourself to read it from time to time. The clearer your goal, the greater your faith. All right. Again, these are words for passion. And we're giving you a word along with a scripture and then a saying to hopefully help fuel your passion. Holy Spirit. That's the next one. Next word up. Praise God. Holy Spirit. Acts 1 and 8, which is where we're headed for now. We are, again, just about a week out from Pentecost. And we will come together and worship God has such a special word. I do hope you'll come out because this is uh, something we've been really excited about and, and looking forward to having our time together. Again, Acts 1 and 8 of Holy Spirit, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, because that's what Holy Spirit does. That's what he's here for. He is your helper, okay? Why don't you say it with me again? Holy Spirit, I always acknowledge you. I never ignore you. 
You should always acknowledge Holy Spirit in everything. You think, well, not everything. Absolutely. You know, I remember uh, going to court for a friend and all the family members and different ones were there and, you know, just kind of getting to know each other. And when lunchtime came, we were all down the cafeteria having lunch and I stopped and I asked a blessing over my food. And one of the people, little family member, some guy, he goes, well, gee, you don't trust God enough that you have to ask him to bless your food before you eat it. And for a moment, it just struck me. I'm like, wow, I didn't even know he was watching. But anyway, I said, no, it's not that I don't trust him. I just like talking to him. Well, he was just floored and he just, he didn't have an answer. Left me alone. <laughs> Glory to God. You know, don't let anyone cramp your style with your relationship with Holy Spirit. That's your relationship. I didn't even know the person was watching me. It was just a big group, big crowd. I'm like, all these people at the table, you have to bother with me. You got to pick on me because I bless my food before I eat it. And I mean, that was the Holy Spirit because at first I was kind of stunned. I'm like, I didn't even know you was watching. What you watching me for? I, I was kind of stunned. But the Holy Spirit, that had to be him because I just very calmly said, I just like talking to him. It's not that I don't trust him, bless my food. I just like talking to him. And he was just done, finished. It's like, you just don't let them cramp your relationship. That's your, that's my, I feel like that's my relationship. You ain't even none of your business. <laughs> okay. Glory to God. Here's your saying for Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only person capable of being contented with who you are. He's the only one. He is the only person contented with you being who you are. He, he just, he's not trying to mess with you like folk do. That's why you always acknowledge him. Holy Spirit is the only person capable of being contented with who you are. He knows who God has made you to be. You know, he's not going to try to make you defend yourself or prove yourself to anybody. He won't do it. In fact, he'll help you give them a good, reasonable answer so they'll leave you alone. <laughs> Glory to God. All right, let's go on to the next word up. You good, Case? Okay, next word up is loss, L-O-S-S, -S, loss. Joel, Joel 2, verses 25 and 26. Everyone has suffered loss at some point. Everyone has had to deal with loss in one way or another, you know, whether it be family, whether it be relationships, whether it be finances. Let's look at Joel chapter 2 and verses 25 and deal with this word loss. It says, I will restore to you the years <laughs> that the locusts have eaten the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. These are four different seasons of four different loss, four different types of loss. My great army, which I sent among you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Isn't that nice? That no matter what the loss was, you're not gonna be ashamed because he's gonna restore. I like in First uh, Kings chapter eight, he says, I will restore all. He tells the widow, restore all unto her from then up until now. So you can trust your Lord, you can trust your God. All right, and you're saying, you're saying for loss is the quickest cure for ingratitude. When people are not grateful, the quickest cure for ingratitude is loss. Come on, you, you've heard it before. You know, when people are ungrateful and always whining and complaining, never thankful. When you don't know how to thank God for what you have, you'll lose that. And then you'll be glad for what you get. Praise God. So yes, the, the quickest cure for in, ingratitude is, is loss. I, I've experienced that myself. You find out, wow, things are not, it wasn't that bad after all. Wasn't that bad. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Wasn't as bad as I made it out to be. 
and then you become grateful and grateful people of God. Oh, that, that, I can't say enough about gratitude because it just, I tell you, it'll shield you from so many things. You just learn how to tell God, thank you. And just thank him anyway. Thank him for nothing. <laughs> thank him for nothing. Glory to God. Ooh, that's good. All right. All right. Now, Here's your next word up. Your next word up is, um, let me see, Proverbs 12 and 15, Proverbs 12 and 15. And we're going to talk about mentorship, mentorship, which is what today is all about. Mentors menu is what we mentor and help people to come into far more into themselves. You know, mentoring is not so much about what your business is or what your gift or what your goal. It's really about you. It's mentoring you because the gift is perfect. Your gift does not need mentoring. OK, your talents, those things come from God. You know, every good and perfect gift comes from above. But that gift has to come through an Im imperfect vessel, which is us. Our vessels, our flesh is what's the problem. I told you the flesh comes with a warning. <laughs> the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> we have a, a warning stamped on us. And the truth of the matter is, it has to, that wonderful gift has to kind of get through this realm of flesh. And so mentorship is really for you personally to help you to be able to come up to the level of this wonderful gifting that God has given unto you. And gifting is massive. It comes in many ways. Don't reduce it or limit it to just certain things. All right. Proverbs 12 and 15. Tw Proverbs 12 and 15 says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. He thinks he's right no matter what. But he that hearkens unto counsel, who's willing to be counseled and listen to somebody, is very wise. Okay? That's what mentorship is all about. Like I said, teacher, they, they seek you out. Okay? But mentor, you have to seek them out because they have learned some things, they have knowledge, they have areas that they've already been through and they can help you where you're headed, uh, where they've already been. And if you'll listen, then you can be wise and learn some things, okay? All right, here's your saying for mentorship. There are two ways to get wisdom, mistakes and mentors. There are two ways to get wisdom mistakes and mentors. So you can go ahead and make your own mistakes or you can get a mentor and kind of override and pass them and don't have to go through that. It's totally your call. All right. Next word up. Next word up. Now this is an important one because you've heard me talk about it many times. Proverbs 15 and one, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse one. And your word up is negotiation, negotiation. Now you've heard me talk about non-negotiable areas in our life. Everyone has a non-negotiable. No one uh, can get through life without having some non-negotiables. There are just some things that you're not going to discuss. You're not going to talk about it because it's a non-negotiable. But then there is negotiations. There are some things that must be negotiated. So let's talk on this side of negotiation. And Proverbs 15 and 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Always learn how to negotiate. When something is working uh, in a situation where it's half, half and half and you need to negotiate. I remember the first car I ever bought, I had finally got a car. My first car I bought was, I, I think I might have been like, I don't know, 40 years, years old or something, 40 plus years. And I saw the car that I needed. It was a Mazda, low miles, nice, clean looking car. And I knew exactly what I had, but I wanted to have a little change. You know how you want to buy something and have some change left? I, I want to have a little gas and you know, be able to go somewhere, whatever, have a little lunch, celebrate my first new car. And I knew that it was going to be difficult because the guy was talking fast when I, when I 
walked in the door. He thought, oh, he got everything on it. Here it is. This is this was your car. It's waiting for you. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that was wonderful. That was an open door for me to start negotiating. And I talked very nice, very calm. I don't care how loud and excited. You'd be surprised how if you keep a mellow tone in your voice, no matter how loud and excited someone gets, just stay at that same mellow tone. I'm telling you, you can move mountains. A soft answer really does turn away rap. And no matter how excited, well, this is how much it is. We're not going to change. I said, okay, all right. But it never got me. And that's time. Sometimes people do that. They get all loud and excited. They try to draw you into that. Okay. You want to resist doing that. You want to resist. Just stay calm and just keep your same voice going on. And I knocked that thing down to way I had. In other words, I had some change. <laughs> I had some change. Glory to God. I know for a fact that if you don't let them draw you in, you're going to win. Glory to God. Let me give you your word. Let me give you your word for negotiation. Nothing is ever as it first appears. Nothing is ever as it first appears. Okay, that situation appeared like, oh my goodness, how am I going to get through this guy is all hyped up and loud and anxious and hyper. So that's how it appeared. But I stayed true to who I was and what I wanted. I had a goal already set in my mind. I had exactly how much I was going to pay for it. And, you know, at one point when he thought I was about to walk away, because I got up and like, mm, okay, okay, okay. Let me see. Let me, he went back in the back trying to act like he talking to somebody. Ain't nobody back there <laughs> trying to act like he talking to somebody. It was a wrap. Okay. Nothing appears. What do you think? You think it's one thing. Mm -mm. No, it's not. Nothing ever is as it first appears. Be smart and know that. Okay. Stay true to you. That's good. Stay true to you. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Your next word up. Your next word up. We good case? All right. Next word up. Obedience. Okay. We talked a little bit about obedience, didn't we? Yes, we did. We talked a little bit about obedience. Isaiah 1 and 19. Isaiah 1 and 19. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And we know obedience is better than sacrifice. And we know that you can't change the subject. If God asks you to do something, he won't change the subject so you can go on to something else. You have to do exactly that. You can't skip and change the subject on God. Obedience. Obedience is wonderful. You feel blessed when you obey. And it is, it's a wonderful door opener. The more obedient you are, see, the more God can bless you and trust you because he knows you're going to be obedient. Your saying for this word obedience is the instructions you follow determines the future you create. Say it again, because this is what your obedience will do. The instructions you follow determines the future you create. Glory to God. So again, take that as a good word and not something negative, because folk act like obedience is a bad word. <laughs> and it's the blessing for your future. All right. Your next word up. Hope you're following with me. We're almost there. We're just about at the end. Overcoming. Overcoming. Overcoming is kind of like that word outlasting. When we said some things you fight, but then there are some things you have to outlast. You just got to outlast it. Ephesians 6 and 13. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13. Your word overcoming. Okay. It says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand, okay? That's overcoming. That's outlasting. Like I said, there are things you have to fight. We know that. But then there are other things you just got to outlast it. And that goes back to understanding your goals 
and your, your integrity, your principles. You don't let anything change the character of who you are. Your saying for overcoming, your saying for overcoming is what you fail to conquer will eventually conquer you. What you fail, and we know this because it, what you, you know, you, there's certain things you just don't tolerate straight up from the beginning. There are some things I have made up in my mind. I just won't tolerate it. Won't tolerate certain things from my household. Won't tolerate some things in a work situation. There are just some things you don't tolerate. Glory to God. And you understand certain things, you must conquer them so they, they cannot conquer you. What you fail to conquer will eventually conquer you. All right? So you overcome it. God knows what you're able. He'll never put more on you than you can bear. All right? Glory to God. All right, we're down to just about the last one. See how much time I got. Okay, we'll do this one. The last two is your 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 word, your word up is promotion, promotion, promotion. That's where you're all headed. God has a spiritual promotion for you, and we'll talk really about that uh, come Sunday morning. It, it's just a wonderful word that God has for you. All right, promotion, promotion. Psalm 75 and 6 and 7. Psalm 75, verses 6 and verses 7. Your word up is promotion. It says, for promotion comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and he sets up another. I like this because it gives you exactly the understanding. You know, the, the throne of God is located in the northern section of the third heaven. And so when he says that promotion, he's saying it comes only from God, that when God decides to promote you, do you know that not your boss, your supervisor, your man, or not even owner can do anything about it? When God decides to promote you, it's because you have mastered the level that you're at. When you've mastered that level, there's no place else to go but up. This is how God works. That's how promotion works. Word up, people of God. That's the word of God to you. And promotion is coming to those who have been steadfast and faithful and have mastered where they are. All right. Your word for promotion is you can only be promoted by the person whose instructions you follow. When you follow the instructions of the Lord, he's going to promote you. Again, you can only be promoted by the one whose instructions you follow. When you follow his instructions, you're going to be promoted. You can only be promoted by the person whose instructions you follow. When God gives you instructions. Some of you are being instructed right now. It may not make sense and doesn't seem important, but it's preparing you for promotion. Follow the instructions. Why? Because you can only be promoted by the one who's instructing you. You follow them. You do what they tell you. Because why? That's how you're going to be promoted. Glory to God. All right. And your last word, your last word is prosperity. Prosperity. Psalms 35 and 27. 35 and 27 Psalms. And this is your last word, prosperity. Glory to God. All right. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which have pleasure in the prosperity of his saints. He's excited for you. You pleasure God when you prosper. Understand how important your well-being is to a king. A king's reputation is based on the well-being of his people. So again, these uh, messages of 
you know, poverty and lack, and you're not supposed to have this, and you're not supposed to, don't read your word. What does the word of God say? What does the Bible say? Don't go by what someone else has said. That's their own personal experience. If that's what they want to be, then fine. I tell you, I know what it is to be totally without, I mean, bottom of the barrel, and I know how it is to have more than enough and have enough and from having enough to more than enough, and I like the, the latter better. So again, do what the word says. Don't go by what someone else tells you. Stay in the word of God. God gets pleasure, says he has pleasure in the prosperity of his people. All right. And your word for prosperity, prosperity is having enough of God's provision to complete his instructions for your life. Wow, that just closes it down, that shuts it down just like that. Prosperity is having enough of God's provision to complete his instructions for your life. His instructions gives you the promotion, the promotion gives you the provision for the instructions for your life. Isn't that nice? Spirit of living God, we thank you so much for the word of God. Thank you for your people. They are hungry for your growth and for your spirit and for your wisdom, for your knowledge and for your understanding. And we just speak that upon them, each and every one of them. Thank you, God, even for my on-site shepherd, our very own Minister Melinda, who has blessed the residents there. We say a blessing to each and every one of the residents there that are listening. We love you. We pray for you. We lift you up in prayer that God would just bless you, that he would strengthen you, that he heal you, that he encourage you and lift you up in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord God, for the word of God. We receive it. It's in our hearts. We're so glad for it. And we call it done. And it is so in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Blessings to each and every one of you. Look forward to seeing you. We have a wonderful, wonderful message for you on tomorrow morning. Make sure you join us. Be right on time. You don't want to miss not one minute of it. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We'll see you then. What up, Kingdom Citizens? Here are our announcements for today. Join us on Sunday, May 28th, 2023 at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time at Delta Hotel Woodbridge, located at 515 U.S. Highway 1 South, Island, New Jersey, as we celebrate Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday. For more information, go to wordofink.org. Come and SOS a sponsor of streaming, and help us to continue to share the teachings of the kingdom. For more information, go to wordofink.org and click on SOS. We thank you in advance. Watch our services online on our website, IBM Video, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. For more information, you can go to our website at wordofbank.org. You can email us at wordofbank at yahoo.com or you can call us at 1 877 Word Up One. Oh, Lord.